Hello guys and welcome back to La Cancha and today we're going to start with Barcelona. We've seen a flood of 0-0s but with Barcelona we know they're always consistent with the 1-0 to Barcelona. It's their it's the third game in a row. How many games in a row has it been 1-0 scoreline for Barcelona? It was 1-0 against us last week. <laughs> we actually, to be fair, okay, besides the Copa game, we actually won 2-0 against Cadiz for a change. And then I think we beat Villarreal 1-0. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't want to come off as someone who is a sport fan, but I want <laughs> us to batter teams. Like, come on. <laughs> yeah. So so where, where do you want to start? Should we start with the classical that happened or should we start with the Valencia game? Should I start by mocking my greatest rival of Valencia? I don't know. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let, let's start. With, let's start with the classical. It's like yeah. um, a lot of people they've been saying that it's Xavi Simeone. Like Xavi played, he didn't play the Barca way. Like the Xavi Neta is parking the bus, and it, uh, like, what do you think about that? Because even Simeone said that, like, yeah, like different playing styles are useful, and Xavi used the playing style to perfection in that game. Yeah, I think people are very, are going to jump to one extreme or the other. I think we should look at Javi's words to take something from it. He said he intended the team to have as much of the possession as possible, but they lost control. And I felt the same way watching the game because Real Madrid started pretty well. And I I feel like we have a problem of a team that has Pedro and a team that doesn't have Pedro. They're almost two different teams at times. And you could tell with the performance. I will say though that the defending that we did, I think that's just a result of us being better defensively this season. I didn't think we set out to be defensive from the get go, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I, I, I do think that, but I do feel like this season Barcelona has relied too heavily on its defense. I know it's a great defense, and that's something that Barcelona is not used to having, but. The fact that the defenders are so good, it feels like sometimes they don't really focus too much on the attacking compared to last season where the defense was a, was an obvious weakness um, because Arao was out so much. But like they, the attacking play when Xavi was at his peak was impressive, to say the least. I feel with the attacking, the problem is the individuals themselves just making forgive my language, absolutely bring the decisions on the counter. Like, some of the, every time we attack, half of the time I'm just putting my hand in my head wondering how the play broke down. So I feel like the team is trying to get the second goal that will seal the game and then something just ridiculous happens to prevent us from getting that goal, whether it's failure to beat a man or making the wrong pass, not keeping your head up, or (laughs) in the funniest example of all, stopping your own teammate from scoring. I mean, (laughs) you know the the famous touch of Hugo Duru for Valencia? (laughs) If Real Madrid come back in this time, it's the touch of Ansu Fati that's Mm -hmm. helped them because... (sighs) I mean, it, it is true we've... You know, kind of relied on defending a bit too much when we could have yeah. scored the yeah. second goal. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to run through some stats though because this is this is why the um, the attention, the focus has been so much on this game. First of all, possession, sixty five percent, thirty five percent. Real Madrid winning that. Shots, thirteen shots. Real Madrid, four shots. Barcelona. Passes, five hundred and ninety six passes. Real Madrid, three hundred and seven. Barcelona. Corners, eleven to two. <laughs> well. Like I said, Real Madrid were quite dominant. I also feel like, and I feel like it's more down to them controlling the game better than us. And that's something that worries me in the long term, like the future when Pedro is not on the pitch. Yeah. I mean, you can clearly see with three more defensive minded players in midfield. I'm, the young is probably most attacking out of the three midfielders that started. Can clearly see like it. It's not the same thing when Pedro yeah. plays. So that's yeah. something. 
and, and, we and should people, address. And I think we were right to ask the question because philosophically, that's this is not the Barcelona that, that many of us have grown to know. Like we're, mm-hmm. we're accustomed Barcelona to be a team of like wonderfully gifted midfielders, gifted attacking players, gifted fullbacks in terms of attacking, and maybe not the defensive uh, of the good defensive center backs and. As you rightly said, like in on Wednesday, it's like he played at Xavi. I'm um, sorry, Thursday. It's like he played four. I think he played the four midfielders, but like a lot of them were mostly defensive-minded midfielders. Like, mm-hmm. and we're counting Roberto, who most of his career has been a right back. So mm-hmm. it, it's just I, I I do think maybe like in terms of if they are to recruit in the summer, maybe to bring the joy back, maybe they need more of those like attacking threat players than Barcelona at the moment because yeah. it's clearly lacking, if we're being honest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I was just thinking of, okay, who could possibly replace Pedri? I mean, I thought of two players. One is in the team, but Xavi doesn't want to use him in Pablo Torre. I also hear like the guy doesn't want to play beating matches or something. So I think there might be an attitude problem there too. Another one is to go to the Canary Islands and get a Moilera. I mean, Canary Island midfielders are just different. That's Russell that. said that. <laughs> but I think that one is beyond us if they get promoted. And compared to like right back and a boost guest replacement, I don't think that's as crucial yeah. in terms of buying people. Yeah. But regardless, it worked on Thursday, so I it, can't it, it really work, complain too much. It, it did work, but it's like it, there's only so much like Barcelona can, so many times Barcelona can write a lot. To be honest, I won't say we were lo- we were more lucky on Sunday than on Thursday because Real Madrid didn't for one for one thing they didn't even test their stadium. Yeah. They didn't test, forget their second, they didn't test Marcos Alonso because when I saw this guy in the lineup, I was praying. I was like, oh God, yeah, yeah. Roman, not they had zero shots on target. But to be fair, like there were seven block shots in that game. They had seven shots inside the box that were blocked. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess overall, it's a performance that. I'm happy we got the results, but if we didn't get the results, I probably will be more critical than I am. It just do, it just worries me for the future, though, like in terms of our attacking play. Yeah, it really does. And, and let's move on to Sunday. And on Sunday, um, it, it was more of, the, more of the same, though. It was like Barcelona, it was a similar trend where Barcelona gets the first goal. Uh, they play really well for the, for the first goal, but after the first goal, it's like they just go into this law where they allow the team to come back. And luckily, they're playing against a Valencia team that were really struggling in terms of um, attacking play. Mm-hmm. Araujo makes a really silly error for the red card. And, and at the end, I feel Valencia were robbed because I feel that was a stone cold penalty that wasn't given. Well, I feel it's a penalty too because... I've seen we've got we had one against us like that earlier in the season that I felt should have been a penalty, so it would be hypocritical of me to say it's <laughs> not a penalty, yeah, because yeah. it's a penalty. Yeah. I, I don't know why they didn't call him over, but Yeah, because because if it's a corner, right? Like Cassier must have touched it, but Cassier doesn't touch it. And it's like it, you're making a wrong call and it's I feel it's one of those situations where he, the referee might feel like he's a pretty no, like very hard contact referee, Abelor Rojas, and that's why I like him. And, and it might feel like, okay, it's gone down, but like I don't think it's a foul in terms of like there isn't that much contact, and so that's possibly why he doesn't give it. But I do feel like if you're going to make a decision at that point and you're going to say it's a corner, and that's why you're not giving the penalty, then at that point, VAR should step in. Um, I admit that I remember telling you that while this play was going on, I had to like stop watching the game. Yeah. Was it a corner from that or a goal kick? A corner. Corner. I guess his reason is that Kessie won the ball. Cause if you look at it from the angle where he's behind them, it looks yeah. like Kessie wins the ball. When you look at it from other angles, it's clear he doesn't. Yeah, but but that's why we have the bar, right? Yeah, that's why we have the bar. 
if this was before like 2020, I would have been like, you know what, I can see what he's doing. And he's a mm-hmm. very good referee. I, I really like him. Uh, but this is in a post bar world where the VAR should step in and be like, hey, that's a clear, you've made an error there. I know, mm-hmm. and you need to have a second look at this. And that's why the technology exists. Yeah. And with what's happened this season, what I feel the technology should go to, to another level is that I do think teams should get a chance to force a VAR review. Yeah. At least one or two chances per game to force a VAR review. Because, for example, something like this, like Valencia is in relegation battle. And every point matters. And if you get a point at a camp meeting, that could be the difference between being in La Liga or Segunda in the second season. And it's same, not just for teams like Valencia, but even teams like Barca, Madrid, like in years gone by where the title race was decided by a point or two, like those mm-hmm. decisions make a big impact on who wins the title and who doesn't. So I do feel teams should have that option where it's like if they feel really ag- aggrieved by something and they have the replay there, they should be able to force a VAR review to get the referee to actually look at it. And if the referee does want to change his mind, he does want to change his mind. What do you yeah. think about that? I think, honestly, it's a good idea because the, the rules of football are the problem. It's not even VAR on the referees in some cases. I feel like the rules where you can only use VAR in certain situations don't make any sense. But yeah. in any case, we've seen even in this league that even when VAR is used, they can still mess things up like <laughs> Ask poor Cardis who won the league to be suspended. <laughs> yeah. So, honestly, I, I don't even know anymore. I just yeah. wish we could stop talking about the referees and talking yeah. about the games more. Yeah, yeah. So, let's, let's get back to the game. And as you mentioned, like, a poor old Ansi Fati, he's, he's having such... He's having a poor moment at the moment. And uh, Ferran, too, he got that penalty and he, he, he couldn't put it away. And that's one of the things that's happened with Barcelona is that when there are ones who are up, they get the second chance and they don't like take it. it. To be fair, right? After the penalty miss, Fatih was Fatih looked fired up and even hit the post, but then Javi took him off because <laughs> Araujo got sent off. And to be honest, I won't blame Arao for getting sent off. I'll blame Kunde for like putting him in that situation where he had to get sent off because I don't know though. Araujo, he's a B- both of them, yeah, both of them. He do are too close to each other. Yeah, yeah and I, I do think Harrell could have caught Juro, so I, that's why I do put more of the blame on him because he's a very quick player, he's very strong, he's very aggressive. Right. You I know. do think he could have recovered and he could have made a great tackle. Yeah, and possibly. Juro is not, he's not David Villa, so there's no yeah. chance he could have missed. <laughs> you could also, uh, this is kind of going to sound a bit funny, but you could have said, it's Ter Stegen, he'll probably save it, or yeah. it's Duro, he'll <laughs> probably miss it. <laughs> Yeah, but as for the penalty, I do have to say something. Like, if the coach says Ferran should take the penalties and he has scored some penalties for us, like, let him take it. Like, all these little teams putting extra pressure on the penalty kick takers, yeah. I'm not going to help anyone. No, it's not really. But I guess moving on from this game, the good news for Barcelona is that they are top of the league. They're nine points higher of Real Madrid, who... They're also having problems in terms of finding the goal. They haven't, I believe they've only scored, um, they've only scored mm-hmm. one goal in their last three games. Mm-hmm. That, that's insane from Real Madrid. Like, what's gone on with their attacking output? I feel their problem against Atleti was they were just flat throughout. Like, there was, there was no, there was little to no attacking endeavor. It was just a completely flat performance, especially. When they went up to ten, when they were up a man yeah. against Barca, it was frankly stupidity. I'll tell you why stupidity. Because how can you do the same thing over and over again? You're trying the same central one twos. You're trying to centralize the play instead of stretching the pitch, and you expect it to work. Like at a point, I'm like, you guys should use your heads a little bit. <laughs> Vinny is not beating Arao today. Like me. Maybe go test Baldi or Marcos Alonso. Yeah. Oh, they even brought on Rodrigo. One would think, okay, you'll bring Rodrigo to maybe stretch the pitch, you know? But instead, Rodrigo comes central and they're like congesting the center of the pitch, trying to spam one twos off each other. Like, that may work against 
lesser teams, it's not going to work against more. Oh, no, 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 no. But not, but it's work against lesser defenses. Yeah, that's yeah. a better way. Because yeah. it's worked against Liverpool, and Liverpool ain't exactly a lesser team. <laughs> but anyway, the thing is that unless you're playing against a defense that's totally stupid, you're not getting those one, this random sporadic moments of brilliance aren't going to work like that. You need the organized way of doing things. And against Betis, who aren't as good defensively as us, some of them worked out, but then the finish was lacking. Yeah. And, and is there a problem with Benzema? Because he hasn't been the same throughout the season, Benzema. Oh. I don't feel the problem is with him, really. I feel... It... I Before you could he's say... Six goals from open play. Okay, true, there's that. I mean, the injuries haven't obviously helped his rhythm as well. But I feel... Against, against Liverpool, he looked like Benzema of last season. Since then, and in most other games, you say he hasn't looked like that. I feel it's because of the same coaching problem and the approach to picking up low block, picking apart low block defenses. Like they, they just keep trying the same things that don't work and they don't do anything else. Yeah, at, at what point do we say it's a matter of the talent that they have and maybe they need a different sort of talent? Like someone like Caviarella from Napoli. Hmm. Yeah, Vinny is a pretty talented guy too. So I don't think it's exactly a talent issue. I I feel Ancelotti needs to tweak his approach to breaking down low block defenses. But if he doesn't do it, I'm fine with it. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't mind seeing them struggle to break down teams, but I feel yeah. it's more down to coaching them personnel, this yeah. particular problem. Yeah. And from a real Betis perspective, like obviously getting a point against Real Madrid is brilliant. They're still, they still have the top four in their hands. Uh, they're playing against Manchester United next in the Europa League and the United, they lost historically <laughs> this weekend. Uh, that, think that, that, that was so fun, yeah. Um, I don't think... It depends on it depends on Manchester United. If it's the same Manchester United that lets one bad result or sets back just completely rock them and they let the soft underbelly show its face its face again, then Betis have a chance. Yeah. If this if my United sorts their heads out and you know play to their best, it's going to be difficult for Betis. Yeah. But like as a Betis fan, I would have preferred it if they lost, but they lost like in a way that where it was like somewhat respectable and they could like okay, like get away with it. But if it's the result is this big, they're going to want to they're going to want to show a response in front of their fans. And I think that might be scary for Betis, but given the fact that they've defended well, but I also worry for Betis because they they're without Nabil Fakir, who's been to be mm-hmm. a big miss. Yeah. But uh, according um, to Pellegrini, Canales will be back for this game. So mm-hmm. uh, I, I hope they're able to put out a performance on Thursday that keeps them in the tie when they come back to Spain. Yeah. I feel basically the, the way you actually stop my United is similar to the way you kind of stop Real Madrid. Except my United seem to have more of a, more ideas of how to break things down. At at least from what I've seen this season, they are able to deal with low block defenses better than they used to. Whereas if you just open up against them and let them counter you, they'll just kill you. So, yeah. you know, Petzela and Luis Felipe need to just not make these rash challenges that they got away with on Sunday, if we're being honest. Yeah, and Luis Felipe hopefully not get a red card. <laughs> Uh, yeah. That too, but yeah. you know, thankfully for Betis, they didn't get a red card on Sunday. When <laughs> at a point, I thought you know, Pezzella is on red card. What we do is just <laughs> dive in. Yeah, and and just to to go away from this game in terms of controversial decisions, the goal from Karim Benzema was ruled off for a Rudiger handball. Do you agree with that decision? Yeah, if it touches the hand. 
of an attacking player should be disallowed. It should be disallowed, yeah. Well, better so they're on the Which, edge. So can I say something? Yeah. Which is why it did not make sense that Almeria scored a goal against Betis. That <laughs> had a, I got these referees, man. <laughs> yeah, like, like even going back, talking about the referees, it's like um, with the Savage, uh, he made a comment after Vinicius grabbed uh, Frankie de Jong in, in El Clasico, and it's like, that's the same incident with him and uh, Ferran. <laughs> and then both of them got a red card. No, I, I, that didn't even occur to me at all. I was just yeah. wondering why Vinny doesn't get yellows for literally insulting referees. <laughs> well, Levy just makes a gesture and gets a two-game ban. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not insinuating anything. No, no. no. My I club is in no position to insinuate <laughs> no, things no. since we're under investigation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Betis they're on the edge of the Champions League race, while Sevilla are on the edge of getting relegated pretty much. And with, with what we saw against Atletico, um, it does, they did look like a relegation team. They did look like one of the worst teams in La Liga. Atletico Madrid, obviously, they were in festive mood. It was Diego Simeone's 613th matches manager, making him the, um, the manager with the most amount of matches in Atletico's history. And they did really respond. Depay scoring a brace, Griezmann being Griezmann, even Morata came off the bench and scored twice. So it, it was a very fun performance from Atleti. Yeah, it was, it was a great attacking display, you know, with, and congratulations to Simeone. He gets a lot more flat than he deserves. And it's, it's, it's great to have him in the league, honestly. And to have, because it's rare to see managers that last this long. But, yeah, yeah, especially for I mean, I hope Xavi will last that long. Because, <laughs> you know, some, sometimes he, he does make me wonder. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Anyway, back to Simeone. It's, it's great what he's achieved at Atleti. And the way the team celebrated it was pretty special too. Yeah. And but he... honestly, Sevilla's defending, especially for the first goal, like Nyanzo and Goodell just letting the pie run through like like they like they have some bugs or a glitch in the system. It's just yeah, that's kind of sad and pathetic. Yeah, Nianzo has been has been an absolute flop for Sevilla, and the thing is, like, I, I go back to this. Like, I think they would have this problem with any manager. It goes back to the summer, mm-hmm. like, Nianzo and and um, Marcao or Marcel. They both cost forty five million euros combined, and with that amount of money, right? You can say, oh, they sold Carlos, they sold Kunde. So that's why they're not that good. But you have center backs worth 45 million euros. No team in this league, apart from the big three, have center backs worth 45 million euros starting for them. Yeah. So, or, or in their squad. Mm-hmm. So I do think it's, it's an issue of like not recruiting properly. And Nianzu barely had any experience at Bayern. I don't know what Munchie was trying to do there, but he's come in and he's been a disaster. Like every time he plays, it's an accident waiting to happen. And um, <laughs> it, it, you can tell because like when Bade came in, Bade was so strong. It, it was so, like he, he was a defender that gave a lot more security. And now that he's been injured, you can see the same old issues come back to the fore for Sevilla. Yeah. And to be honest, but the January signings have been the only good signings this season. Every Everything else has just been a car crash. And you really worry for them. Like, this is the kind of performance combined with letting us as soon as run riot at the Sanchez Pedro last week that makes you think about them get, getting relegated again, especially when they were like in a good period of form, you know? So, yeah, yeah. It's like the thing is, if they had won the game against Rayo and the game against Asuna, they would have been possibly in in the shout for at least a top seven because they would have had at least thirty points by then. But mm-hmm. with, with this, with the with the last two performance, the, like the situation has radically changed, and I don't think the players have faith in Sampaoli's ideas anymore because. Welcome to the club. 
yeah, yeah. Because the thing is, you see what Acuna did the week before, where he gets, he sees the paper that Sampali has given to, I think, is Goodell, Goodell, and he tears it and he throws it away. He speaks about how no one understands what they're doing, what they're meant to be on the pitch, and that's pretty damning for Sampali. Yeah. And it's also damning for Sampali. This is a stat I just went through. Out. It's like the last two times they've been to the Metropolitan, it was lost at one. <laughs> <laughs> and Atleti are another team that scores like goals for fun at the moment and so that's there's there's a lot of pressure on him and a lot of things have gone against them pretty drastically yeah like you said the overarching villain of this season for Sevilla is Monchi I mean, yeah. and Sao Paulo is just a co-villain or rather a villain of this particular arc of Sevilla because yeah. You, everyone on this pod knows how much I hate watching this man's teams play because I don't understand what he's doing. And if I don't understand it and the players don't understand it, then who understands it? Him? Yeah, yeah the thing is, he's a chaotic manager, right? And that works when things are going on well and you actually have the players for it. Because like in his first stint, he was like, it was this chaotic, but you got the results, but now you're in a different scenario where you're fighting relegation. And, and I think the good thing from Sevilla's point of view is that their next five games are against teams in similar situations. They're playing Almeria next. They're playing Catafi after that, Cadiz after that, Sevilla, Valencia. And this is where I feel he's going to be really tested and he's going to have to deliver results because Atleti is not in Sevilla's league at the moment. Even which is hard to say because they're, they're both so close to each other and they've been close to each other for the past three seasons. And yeah. in the Europa League, I'm not I'm not sure whether they should be in that competition. I know it's their fetish competition, but they have been about you who are doing pretty well in the Turkish League. And maybe if they get a result there, maybe it changes the dynamic. True. I mean, I guess a, a good Europa League run will help, but yeah. I. I doubt their ability to make that deep run, to be honest. It wouldn't surprise me if Fenerbahce just walloped them. <laughs> but th- this thing, you know, they beat PSG, PSV 3 0, so they might do that again. I think they're at home in the first leg, right? So, yeah, they're at home in the first leg. And yeah. they, also, they, they missed Fernando in this game. Maybe it would have made a difference. But again, you're relying on like a 36 year old to. <laughs> Who hasn't really been making the difference that much, yeah. if we're being truthful. So, yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, it's still better having Yanzu. Yeah. I'll say that, yeah, he's been he's been such a disaster. <laughs> and, and so, like, what are your verdicts? Like, if they lose San Maria, do you think it's, it'll be time to cut loose on San Paoli? I, I don't think it's, I don't think they should sack him just yet because. Monchi sacking two managers and still being in the job is it shouldn't be allowed. Yeah, and and the thing is, there might be something that might add an extra bit of spice to this because uh, Sevilla's um, institutionally they've been going through issues in terms of the presidents and uh, mm-hmm. the accounts being approved and the former president took the old president's courts and if the former president wins, um, he he's someone who makes very rash decisions, so he could he could get rid of both of them in yeah. the space of two weeks. <laughs> yeah. And, and an international break is coming up soon. As well. uh, true, that's what I, meant. I was going to say, if they lose to both Almeria or Gaddafi or they don't get good results against them, then probably yeah. pack it up for the, pack it up yeah. for San yeah. Paulo and just and to know who they can get. <laughs> like Borderlands is still in the market, but those two games are so important. Yeah, I mean, Borderlands could do something, but <laughs> it's just funny how we were talking about Sevilla in this way when last year we were talking about them in a different, yeah. completely <laughs> different conversation. Yeah, very different conversation. Uh, but like, just just not to like draw on Sevilla, but like, I do feel the next three games are super important because if they win all three, they have the head to head advantage. But the thing is, Catafe, they're in better form. Cadiz are in better form. Al Maria at home, I think that should be a banker because how poor Al Maria is away from home. So, yeah. Okay. True. Nah. Yeah. I think they'll beat Al Maria somehow. 
Yeah. They'll draw with Hatafe and then Cadiz will beat them because Cadiz are cockroaches and don't want to go down. Yeah, they really don't. And they took points off for Real Sociedad recently. And it's zero zero game, like Cadiz they've never won in with Real Sociedad. Real Sociedad they're they're beginning to worry me because their form has been so out of whack recently. Yeah. No David Silva, no party that's the problem, <laughs> truthfully, for his last three, for all of the seasons, he's been there. Yeah, and and you you worry about them because you look at Roma. Roma, they have Dybala, Tammy Abrams. They just got a big results against Juventus, and how that's going to really affect Russell's that that they're way off form coming into their possibly one of the most important stretches of the season. Yeah, so I feel playing against Roma is going to shoot them more than playing against the low blocks of Cadiz and Real Valladolid. Because their problems are creativity issue. When you're playing against a more even opponent and there's more space, creativity becomes less of a problem. Yeah. But then, if Jose Mourinho still plays Jose Mourinho ball, then <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then that's a bit different problem. But I... I think if they get their act together, they can beat Roma. Yeah, you will see about that. They will be in Rome on Thursday. Uh, Villarreal, they're back in European action. They beat Almeria at home, which is something that we don't see very often. <laughs> uh, Gerard Moreno scoring brilliantly. He came back and scored brilliantly. And Chukwese as well, he provided that assist. Morales scoring again. Things look brighter for Setien at the moment. Like a couple weeks ago, he was on the edge. Yeah. They've bounced back with two wins in a row, and Chukwese has been very important in both of those wins. So we've said we've said often how like one of the good things Setien has done is getting the best out of him. You know, now that he's playing on average higher up the pitch than he was under him. So you know, this definitely sets Villarreal back on track. However, I don't. I still don't think they have the consistency to push for top four. I feel their ceiling is sixth place and maybe a conference league win if everyone is fit. Yeah, and it, it was so good to see Lachelso back. Gerard got mm. a rest for this game. Lots of players rested. I think Jackson is also back. So um, mm. that's good news for Villarreal that they're getting a healthier squad. Mm. Um, we're go- I'm going to talk about two zero zeros in a row, and that's <laughs> those, those are Osasuna and Atletico who are also involved in the Copa del Rey. Osasuna won that one one zero at the scoring. Uh, do you see Osasuna going all the way, given Athletic can't seem to find a goal to save their life? Yeah, it's going to be difficult going back to San Mames with, but Osasuna definitely have the tools to do something. I just think with Athletic, I still I really can't figure out what their issue is. Yeah. That yeah, being they said, the, they have the players, and they have the players, and, the players and they actually players. have the stats to prove that they're good attacking yeah, wise compared to last season. Yeah, that's a, it's a really confusing case, and then yeah, they scored more goals than Betis, for example. Yeah. And more than Real Sociedad as well. So it's not like they're super struggling in terms of scoring goals. Mm. Okay, it's a weird one. I do think that with the cup on the line and at home in the second that they'll put up a better fight than they did at Pamplona. Yeah. You, you would hope so. You would hope so. You would hope so, but... At the same time, as soon as making the final with, you know, how the club is being run will be a great story for themselves and Spanish football in the whole and they it 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 will really deserve. What's more but, likely? Also, oh, sorry. But I feel like, like you said, going to San Mes is going to be very difficult. Yeah. What's more likely? Also, sooner finishing seventh or winning the cup? I know that's a stupid question. No, it's not a stupid question. It can't happen. <laughs> no, I'm I'm being serious. I'm not even sure it could happen. <laughs> like, like, what do you think? What do you think they should like? Do you think it's possible to achieve both? Finish. So finish seventh is very. 
I feel they are more likely to finish seventh than win the cup. Why I say that is because the gap between them and the teams, the team in sixth, is not even that much. No. And Villarreal has shown they are very inconsistent. Rayo are in the same boat as Osasuna, where they're like perform overperforming. Yeah. Or performing well for their standard. Athletic club are very inconsistent. So it's possible. Yeah, it is possible. And Rayo it seems like they've already they're like somewhat on the beach. They're already they're they're already there. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. They're relaxing. Because I feel like how we thought about how did Thomas could come in and take this team to another <laughs> that that hasn't happened yet. That's what happened, man. But, but to be fair, I feel we expected too much from him. The fact mm-hmm. that he hasn't played in months, like since May, he didn't play up for like seven months. He was like pretty, pretty much unemployed. So um, it's he's going to need some time to really adjust, to really like get into his stride with, with Ryo. Yeah. Maybe post-international break, we'll see a di- different de Thomas. Yeah, I, I would hope so. And Possibly this might be something we match with till next season to see him in his best form. Sure. Let's move on. Let's move on to the most surprising result of the weekend. Do you guess? Do you know? Do you know what that is? I don't. I don't. Oh, there are too many new news this weekend, man. My brain's dented. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> wait. Is Hatafe scoring three goals a surprise against Girona? Because no, 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 it's, it's it's not that one. I don't have my sound work working, but it's Elche versus Mallorca. Elche finally won oh. a game away from home. Oh against, yeah, that against Mallorca. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of all the teams for Mallorca <laughs> to lose at home to, it's Elche. <laughs> yeah, you're right. This is it's a sick joke. <laughs> Okay, I don't want to r- rule out Chiaot or anything, but isn't them just winning games at this point a, a waste of other people's points? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it possibly is, but like I'm sure they're trying to avoid like because I'm sure before this started, we were talking about how it could be an historic relegation for them, but with one point they match uh, Sporting Gijon, or I think they've already surpassed them, so it's. They won't be the worst worst ever team to to get relegated in La Liga. They, like with the way they're going, they could be they could get more points than Cordoba, which is saying something about Cordoba. But yeah, you're right. It, it, it is they are they are gone right now. They are really gone. So I don't see them catching Valencia. Let's see them get him. Yeah. Well, it's still still I, I it keeps it keeps the dream alive. And yeah, to be fair, I don't think. They're really still, I don't think the word stealing points from Mallorca applies as much as to Villarreal because Villarreal are aiming for Europe, but Mallorca just wants to stay up. And if they get to Europe as a consequence of their good performances, then that's great. Yeah. Yeah. The thing is, Mallorca, though, it's like they're six points behind uh, or six points above Almeria. So it's one of those things where it's like we know they perform poorly away from home. If Hypothetically, like they get into a poor run, they could somehow find a way into in a relegation battle. Because I remember this happening to the team we're going to talk about next, Girona, where in eighteen nineteen they were like so far ahead of everyone, and everyone was like Girona safe, and they somehow got relegated. So I wouldn't count Mallorca out yet at the moment. <laughs> so who's <laughs> so you could. Theoretically, it's a stretch where you could include Athletic Club too. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, you you, you could. You could oh, honestly, you could include anyone that hasn't hit forty points. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but the thing though is, I feel Athletic Club they have they're like going through their worst moment at at this point of the season, mm-hmm. and they yeah. they can always have a higher season to go up to. But with Mallorca, mm-hmm. I feel it's like they're one of those teams that. They're doing well and it's okay, but when they start doing poorly, like really poorly, it might they might go on like a six game losing streak, and before they know it, they might be in a relegation battle. I think. Well, Gavin, first I I don't think 
it will happen because yeah, there's too many teams down there that are so inconsistent. Like now, Espanol, we'll talk about them later. They were looking good like before last week or yeah, this yeah, like, week. We can talk about them now. Like they, yeah. like they lost to by the lead. Yeah, with teams like that, just yo-yo in between 11th <laughs> and 17th place, I think Mario will be fine. Yeah. Yeah, but the the good thing for Vida Lead is like they got away from the Cal Laren dependencia. Honestly, I was very hurt by those results. <laughs> but I feel Vida Lead is the one team that Valencia can catch. And I, I think I feel there are two teams that Valencia need to be better than Cadiz and Vida Lead. So as long as the gap between both of them is like achievable within a win, I'm not as scared. But seeing that Vida Lead are four points higher. <laughs> I'm starting to scare me. It's starting to scare me a bit. But yeah, back down. Cards is, is like cockroaches, so I've given up on them getting really good. Nah, <laughs> nah. I, I feel, I feel with, if we can get them in their stadium and play a very good game, we can beat them. Almeria, we have to go to their stadium, which which is going to be tough. So I don't know. But they're, they're, they're falling like a stone. Like they might actually get relegated at this point, if we're being honest. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, it's just crazy. I mean, by next week, you could be talking about Jordan and Espanol being in serious <laughs> danger again. And then we'll be talking about River, the Leeds mid table push. But, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. And this, 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 from your point of view, being like being really invested in this relegation <laughs> battle, seeing other Valladolid players in Aguado and Ivan Sanchez stepping up to score instead of Calar and is worrying. <laughs> Yeah, it is. And to be honest, River they could have easily had three or four goals in this game. Spanyol, that's bad again. Yeah, like they're they're such a basket case, Spanyol, because they have like mm. two games where they look very good, and when they're about to like just get to that next level, they lose again. So it's it, it, it's mm. really it's really crazy that one. Yeah. But, and the funny thing is that they have one player who's in double digits, and they have another player in Britain who has who. Will most likely reach double digits between now and the end of the season, and they're still in trouble. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, and at some point, do you have to question Diego Martinez because attacking wise, it's clear the talent is there, but he's not getting the results that people expect of him. Yeah, I feel. I always felt like this team, right, is a team that last season do relies heavily upon Darder and. Rodri Thomas, and then when you take one of them out of the equation later on, yeah, you know it's difficult. I always felt like I predicted. I think I predicted my own finish upper mid table because they had both. They would have both Rosalo and De Thomas, but then you know that hasn't happened. Yeah, th- that, they that, have. Been, there, there are so many parts of the squad that are underperforming. That, that transfer, that transfer of data mass laid on is something that really, really hurts Espanol because at the beginning of this of the transfer window, last summer summer transfer window, a lot of clubs were rating that thirty million, and Espanol were like, no, we're going to sell him for forty. And Sevilla they said, "Do I say seventy or anything?" For seventy, yeah, and it was, it was like, at, and when you see at the end they only sold him for seven, it was just that was just a poor decision all around from Espanol yeah. because it would have been a business. much better sport if they. If they sold them earlier on. Uh, but let's move on to the final game, Hetafe against Girona, which was which was an incredible game actually. Uh, Hetafe scoring three goals is something that we don't see every day. Girona scoring two as two as well, something that we're accustomed to. Girona, <laughs> whenever you tune into them, you know you're gonna get goals. And I say that the only they're the only, they're the only safe haven for entertainment <laughs> in this league right now. Everyone else is a, everyone else is a bust like Barcelona. <laughs> Because I'm personally invested, when the every bad decision they make hurts me more than the average bad decision <laughs> that team makes. Real Madrid just boring sometimes. Yeah, Betis are trying now, though. But then, yeah, no, Betis are trying. I, I they've committed the sin of drawing nil nil. <laughs> yeah, I, I think Atleti haven't been bad since the World Cup, to be honest. Yeah, and they they have had they had the odd explosive performance. It's yeah. just when you live in a world where I'm depending on athletic for entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Salto too, Salto too. Like they're like yeah, Salto have been doing well recently. Yeah. We we need to talk about them against Osasuna. Yeah, 
Yeah, because it's zero zero. We're just skipping. We, we still have to follow the zero zeros together. <laughs> to be fair, there was not much to talk about. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All of the goals this weekend just congregated in two games and yeah. said everyone else go swim or whatever. But yeah, Girona and the first goal they considered was just <laughs> typical Girona losing their heads at the back. Even the goal Girona scored. They build up to the goal where Gazaniga just comes flying out of the penalty box and misses the ball. <laughs> and he's lucky that a Jirena player is behind him that can build the play back up and they score from it. I'm like, yeah, just this is why I love this team. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was it was great to see from Hetafe's point of view. I mean, I want them to stay up because they have one now. But then I also want Valencia to stay up. Because yeah. them getting ready to get will just be a, a sick joke. <laughs> so really, this is why I want a team like Cadiz to go down. It, it's, it's not that I hate Cadiz. It's just that by other preference. I, I have some teams I prefer more. Yeah. Uh, so, like, sorry. If so Cadiz, you know, being so <laughs> persistent and never giving up is not good news for you to touch. No, no, it isn't. And, and it... If I could say something about this relegation zone and it's or this relegation battle, it's not just because Valencia is there, but I do feel this is one of those seasons where if like other teams that go down, I'll generally feel bad for them regardless because I feel a lot of teams there, like some have made bad mistakes, but they're either like big teams like Valencia or Sevilla. Obviously, I'm invested in Valencia and not going down. Or the, you have teams like Atafi that have done really well. They're like good teams like Mm-hmm. Cadiz, like even Rao Valley Delhi, like on their day they came like super good. I don't think there's like a, an outrageously bad team there, but there are some <coughs> teams that are super inconsistent. Like the only outrageously bad team in quotation marks is Elche. There but, you go. <laughs> yeah, but but even them, like you can say that they they made some mistakes, and mm-hmm. in a lot of games they've been like quite competitive, and sometimes they've been unlucky. Like, even going back to, I think, the first game where they played against Betis and they suffered a red card in, like, five minutes or something, so. Yeah. I'll say getting that many red cards is more down to self-inflicted wounds than yeah. being unlucky. Well, yeah. I don't, again, I don't think LJ can really talk about being that unlucky when they have a point more than they should. <laughs> I can't just have a point less than they should. Or two so. points less, so, yeah. The two points. <laughs> well, Cadiz could really be like be out of Valencia's league if they're yeah. being fair. <laughs> I know, <laughs> but like if they if Cadiz do go down and it's by a point or by two points, they will. Yeah. That that would be some grave injustice. Like they would, yeah. they should go. They should go all the way. <laughs> yeah, honestly, I I think they were saying something about like you have to go to a certain court to appeal this. Yeah, but like, like that's one of the things where it's like people have this complaint about VAR that it takes too long. But if you're a team like Cadiz, you want VAR to take 10 minutes if it has to, as mm-hmm. long as it gives you like what you feel you deserve. Mm-hmm. And in that game against Elche, it's like that that was pure robbery from that for them. Yeah. Even if someone wants to argue that Elche could have still scored an equalizer, the fact is, is this is not like a what if situation where you're like, okay, let's say Valencia did get the penalty on Sunday that they should yeah. have gotten, but they missed. That's a what if scenario. It's not a guarantee of a goal. This is a goal that knocks you from three points to one point. This yeah. is like a completely different kind of injustice. Yeah, yeah it really is. It really is. But with that, that's all we have for La Liga. We're just going to talk about a few of the Champions League games that are going on. Uh, so no Spanish teams. <laughs> uh, Spanish teams play on Thursdays. Uh, but there's some pretty enticing ties that are finally balanced. Uh, the biggest one of them is Bayern versus PSG. And uh, yeah, I, I, I think both of these teams, they don't fully convince me. Like I watched Bayern over the weekend against Stuttgart and I still see some weaknesses there from Bayern. So, but... With PSG, Mbappe is back. Neymar is off with Rafaela. Um, so maybe, <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe things might improve for them. Yeah. I mean, I I feel like they've 
team PSG have going for them in the second leg is that the up front they have a better balance of attackers in terms of Mbappe being someone that can run in behind and Messi being the guy on the ball. As against the first leg where it was two guys on the ball and no threat in behind. So the, there's a chance they can get, there's a good chance they can progress even without Neymar. Yeah, and I guess the one of the bad news in the last game is that Paul Martinez had to go off. So they might be forced to play a back four with Ramos and Danilo as the centre backs. Okay, then <laughs> it's a, it's um well we'll see what happens, but I still think Bayern will go through. Yeah. And do you think it'll be two German teams going through by Wednesday with Dortmund and Chelsea? If do- if I say Dortmund will go through, then they'll mess up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but even though Chelsea finally won a game this weekend, I still think the Dortmund have been absolutely imperious from this year. Yeah. So like since you'd hope back, it would continue. Yeah, since they came back from the international break, they've always they, seen they've Dortmund. arguably been the most consistent team on the planet. Yeah. Since then. Yeah, it it will be nice. I I'm I'm not sure though. Like I, I, I do worry for Dortmund. Because in the first leg, like, yes, they did get the win. They relied a lot on the defense, and they were obviously playing in front of the yellow wall. And um, they won't have that in Stamford Bridge. So, yeah, I hope Dortmund go through, but I can see Chelsea sneaking it and win it in the side. Then I'm sorry to say you must not be paying attention to Chelsea. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm saying I'm saying it's going to take a real Dortmund mess up for lack of a better word mm-hmm. if they don't go through no i'm saying that just because of the first leg uh the, the first leg, yeah chelsea ended this first leg strong but i feel like it was a consequence of dortmund just being like okay we've gotten the one let's just kind of hold on to that one sure sure yeah we shall see with that one and milan spurs what say you okay you'd hope milan would <laughs> Milan are in better form than Spurs, so you'd hope they can see it out. Yeah. Besides Harry Kane, and funny enough, Emerson Royal, Tottenham haven't really had too many standard performers recently. So yeah. I guess I think Milan will see this one out. It might be a draw. It might it might be a case that both Dortmund and Milan draw, but it draws enough for both of them. Yeah, that is true. And the final game will be Benfica Club Brugge. Benfica with three Gotsu goals in Belgium. Uh, I, I do think Benfica are through. Bar- yeah, Benfica. Yeah, Barnum. Scott, Scott Parker is not coaching there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Benfica are true. Okay. It's just a shame. Just yeah. go <laughs> I mean, But if, if Brugge can mastermind the comeback, that would still be great to see. Yeah, it would still be. Benfica are too strong and the coach uh, of Bruja is too incompetent for my liking. <laughs> I, I, I have a question. Who do you think is more angry with this fixture, Atleti or PSG? Because if PSG had won their group, this would be PSG versus Club Brugge, and they would have been like smoking a cigar to the quarterfinals. And let's say at, let's say PSG, the same thing happened, um, or let's say Benfica won the group. And Atleti finished second. This would be Benfica Atleti, and this would be a reasonable tie for them. Yeah. I don't know. I feel Atleti losing, come, finishing last in Europe yeah. is something they should really be mad about. With yeah. PSG, it just came down to absolute bad luck. Like, it came down to... I feel it's more down to Benfica being absolutely sensational in that group than PSG. Yeah. Because yeah. PSG did their job in all the other games except Benfica. They just faced a very good team on the day. Yeah, Benfica they scored seven goals in, in Israel, which was crazy. Yeah. You could we talk about my trick scene potentially? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean because <laughs> they were it, it, it well I I okay, I'm just joking, but I I I, I do think Benfica and everything, but yeah. if yeah. if they came back to this group stage, I thought that match fixing, I won't be shocked. 
Because the circumstances are so bizarre. Like, you usually get teams being decided this close in World Cup games that are, like, three matches in the group, not six, where, you know, honestly, the six-game group stage format is decided by the fourth game in most cases. Yeah. Yeah, like the, how Benfica fans are won't <laughs> come for me. No, no. If it helps, I prefer them more than Sporting. Yeah, <laughs> and Porto. Yeah, well, Porto will speak about them next week. But yeah, Benfica, they they look set to be in the quarterfinals. And from what I did some research, it'll be the first time they'll be in the quarterfinals back to back since the nineteen sixties. So mm-hmm. that's. Maybe that curse might be broken after all. I, I don't think so, bro. I think so. Yeah, I know. Yeah, of course not. They'll yeah. they'll draw. The, they'll give them an impossible quarterfinal and semifinal all at once, oh. just to appease some millionaire in the US. I, I'll love it if it if Napoli do go through. I love it if it's Benfica Napoli. So at least we'll have an outsider in the semifinals, mm-hmm. regardless of who it is. Yeah. Yeah. And with that, we're going to close up shop, guys. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, please leave a like and share it with your friends or share it with the one or two people you know that would like it. But with that, thank you so much. Adios and see you next week.